The Monsters That Made Us is brought to you by the Cage Club Podcast Network. For all things movies, music, media, monsters, and more, head on over to cageclub.me. That's cageclub.me. Today we're heading deep into the mountains of Tibet, where world-renowned botanist Wilfred Glendon is in search of an extremely rare plant, the Marifaza lupina lumina, which blooms under the light of the moon. But little does Dr. Glendon know that he will be bringing more than just an exotic flower back to London with him. For those mountains are also home to a mysterious creature which also transforms in the moonlight, a werewolf. According to local legends, once bitten, the afflicted is forever doomed to become a monstrous beast who will instinctively kill whomever they love most whenever the moon is full. However, the Marifaza plant may act as a temporary antidote. Will Dr. Glendon be able to successfully harvest this strange plant in time to prevent a horrific murder spree? Grab a Chinese menu and make sure your hair is perfect because we're walking down the streets of Soho in the rain as we discuss Werewolf of London. To a new world of gods and monsters. Listen to them. Children of the night. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! You're crazy to know who I am, aren't you? I'll show you who I am and what I am! <laughs> You're insane. I tell you, I killed a wolf, a plain, ordinary wolf. By studying these and other species, we add to our knowledge of how life evolved, how it adapted itself to this world. He went for a little walk. He face. <laughs> Welcome to the Monsters That Made Us, the podcast where we celebrate the spooktacular characters and films in the Universal Studios classic monster series. Today we're talking about 1935's Werewolf of London, starring Henry Hull as the titular lycanthrope. I'm the invisible Dan Cologne, and joining me as always is my co-host and resident plant expert, Monster Mike Manzi. How's it going, Mike? Oh, hello, Dan. How's it going? Mike, when most people think about werewolves and Universal Studios, Lon Chaney Jr. immediately comes to mind, right? And why shouldn't he? Chaney played Larry Talbot five times for Universal. But I don't think most casual fans are aware that Universal began six years earlier with Werewolf of London. And to be fair, it doesn't really have any huge stars. Its director isn't particularly noteworthy. The Lemleys were barely involved as they were busy losing control of the studio. And even for monster fanatics like us, it tends to rank a lot lower than The Wolfman. However, as we'll discuss, it did, in one way or another, influence most future werewolf films, and of course, Warren Zevon. Now, Mike, I want to get into your thoughts on the film, but before we do that, let's just talk werewolves. What are, what are some of your early memories of werewolves? This is a little tougher to pinpoint, and I don't think I was able to as easily as the previous creatures and stuff, because, you know, like they even mentioned in the movie, these things are, are from folklore, like fairy tale, that kind of stuff. Like, growing up, I feel like that's where I probably first caught wind of them i think it was maybe not even like a wolf thing but like just changelings right just the idea mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that like uh people changing into animals or different creatures in the forest and the forest was sort of dark and full of magic and stuff and i think like you know as a kid the one that maybe sticks out the most when i was first able to like remember back all right this is in pop culture right okay so like aside from like fairy tales and learning about stuff seeing that kind of thing in books in school as a little kid and I think the point where it became like completely obvious to me was Teen Wolf. Sure. Teen yep. Wolf comes along I'm probably like five maybe something like that and uh, leaves a big impression on somebody when they see that image of Michael J. Fox like and he's half wolf and he's really cool and stuff. I always thought of them as like really cool and slick and, and kind of hot and stuff. I don't know you know like werewolves is kind of interesting <laughs> like pure animalistic kind of stuff like the relation to the moon and everything thing and uh you know the whole lunacy aspect of it i just feel like it's on a different level than the previous stuff because it's not being created in the 20th century or, or something like that right like this is stuff from folklore from like old times of just like human history and stuff so kind of kind of hard to pinpoint exactly when but yeah teen wolf was certainly uh the moment where you know there was sort of no turning back like they were in my in my sights from then on out yeah i had a similarly difficult time pinpointing the beginning of my 
experience with werewolves. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, werewolves are sort of mythical creatures, right? The concept of shape-shifting into an animal has existed for as long as there have been human beings that could tell stories. I thought back to my childhood, as close as I can get to my first real werewolf is probably Eddie Munster. You know, the Munsters, like as, as I've established on the show, you know, I, I watched as a kid. That sort of normalized these types of characters for me. And, and I want to say Eddie Munster was probably the first real werewolf that I, if not experienced, the first one I like latched on to. Definitely, because, you know, he was a little kid. He was a little boy, right? Right, So, like, right. you could identify with him, too. Yeah, Eddie Munster was probably at the very beginning, but then as I got older, characters like Remus Lupin in the Harry Potter series became, you know, more prominent werewolf character, and, of course, David Kessler in American Werewolf in London. Yeah, that was a, definitely a, a pivotal one for me as well, was American Werewolf in London, and, you know, I think directly referencing this movie as far as the title goes as well. So Werewolf of London, how did you feel about this particular movie? Does it sort of deserve its reputation or do you think it's a little bit underrated and worth a second look? Right off the bat, it was a hard sell for me just by the title. I was kind of confused as to why they just didn't call this movie The Werewolf. You know, it's not like until later we're going to get the creature from the Black Lagoon, but previously everything has just been, you know, Dracula mummy there seemed to be a rhythm to it like there's something clean about it and maybe it's just like my personal ocd or whatever but just like going into it you know initially i was like oh it's just like not in line in the way that i would have liked exactly like if i was in charge of marketing but once i got past the title which was easy to do you know don't get me wrong I was quite surprised, to be honest with you. I'd only seen this movie about twice. I just checked my letterbox. I think 2017 is the last time I checked it out. It's got problems, but I will tell you this. As it went along, I got way more into it. I think it gets really weird. They throw a lot of stuff at the wall. Not a lot of it sticks. There's there's strange sort of threads that don't really uh, conclude exactly. Stuff in here that just seems like maybe would make a different movie. I'll get to some of that with the plant stuff, perhaps. I have a little bit of a problem between what we're calling a werewolf uh, and what will later be deemed a wolf man. There's some discrepancy here with that as well. And my ultimate takeaway from this is uh, I think what they were going for is not so much a werewolf movie, but maybe more of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde movie. There was an incredible version in 1932 that had come out starring uh, Frederick Marsh, and that movie is just like phenomenal. Um, There's an incredible long first person point of view tracking shot that opens that film and so it seems a little bit of an answer to that to me as well all in all i'm not quite sure they have the formula right just yet for this property but they'll get there I ultimately do enjoy Werewolf of London, but I, I see a lot of its flaws, right? I mean, you made mention of a couple of them, and I'm not sure if, if some of it is, is because I'm viewing it as a werewolf movie through a, a modern lens, you know? Because this was like a, the first attempt at a werewolf movie. They hadn't really figured out what a werewolf movie should be. You know, you can see a lot of the things that would go on to become uh, sort of hallmarks for werewolf lore. and So, like, I, I think I enjoy this movie for a lot of that stuff, you know, seeing sort of the first attempt at something like this and seeing, oh, that stuck, that didn't stick. Oh, that's really cool, you know? So I think I like this movie more than it deserves for a lot of those reasons. The supporting cast in this is really spectacular. I think the leads are a little bit weak for the material. And, and a lot of that has to do with some of the casting that went, that went on. Also the screenplay, which I'll get into. I think the screenplay is just too wordy and it sort of focuses on things that I don't think are very important for this story. So yeah, it's it's a little bit misguided in terms of how it's structured. And, and you know, just, I just, I think it's a little bit misguided overall, you know, so it's not a bad movie. It's just not sure what it wants to be. And I, I think of this movie as sort of like the first pancake when you make pancakes, right? It's always the sacrificial pancake. It's yeah. always going to come out a little funky, but then, you know, you build on that. And that's why the Wolfman, I think, is so much better is because they sort of learn from their mistakes here and then perfected them there. Yeah, I think sometimes that that's a little more fun. Like, no offense to Dracula, but like when we watched him, he's almost all fully formed already with that like initial film, you know? So it's kind of cool when you go back and look at like, say, you know, the first issue of 
Batman, right? And you're like, mm-hmm. how much is actually there in that issue of Detective Comics from Batman and stuff? Is like, oh, he's got a, he's got the Batmobile, he's got the uh, the outfit or whatever. And it's cool to see like throughout the history, like what evolves, what gets dropped, what's picked up. And it's funny to see like we go from here to something like nowadays when I hear like Lichens, I think of like Underworld, right? And it's this like right. crazy Matrix style universe where they're battling vampires for the the fate of humanity and shit and it's just like wild how far that this um has been able to to spread and evolve and all that kind of stuff but but i definitely you know think that there's a lot of great stuff in here i'm just not sure that they were sure like how do you follow bride of frankenstein like that must have been a smash you know like i'm still thinking about it while i'm watching this movie you know and it was like a month ago i think that they were trying to go for a bit of a different thing with this they were kind of reverting maybe more back to that mummy tone a, a little bit more serious definitely within the first half of this movie almost to the point that when i feel the comedy comes it almost smashes down a door a little too hard perhaps and it just didn't didn't have sort of the touch of like james wales or someone you know we've been a bit spoiled i feel within the last couple of months that when they're bringing in this new talent it sort of has a lot of there's a lot to live up to here yeah and, and it's clear in some of those scenes that they tried to bring some james whale to this movie like i said the, the supporting cast i find to be the most entertaining you know i I have the most fun watching sort of the side characters. Some of this has to do with the fact that there there was no source material on which this was based. This is Universal's first purely original treatment. The Mummy kind of technically gets that credit, but as we discussed, you know, it's so much of it is inspired by Dracula that I feel much more confident saying that this is the first time Universal went with a completely original story. Yeah, and I also feel like with The Mummy, it's one of those sort of ripped from the headlines. Like, it could have, parts right. could have been based off of an article, which is like movies nowadays all over the place. Yeah, definitely drew from Dracula, drew from the the headlines and what was happening in Egypt at the the time. But there was really nothing inspiring Werewolf of London, nothing directly anyway. So I I think that that's part of the issue as well, is that there was no source material to rely on to, to guide the story. This was just here's an idea we have, make a movie out of it. Had the screenwriter been a better writer, then the movie might have been ultimately better. I just think part of it is the screenwriter that they chose had very little screenwriting experience. So I think there was not enough experience in the creative element of this film to make it a really good movie. This is what happens when there isn't a blockbuster book by Mary Shelley, or there isn't like That's a, right. or there isn't like a play everyone has to see on Broadway starring Bella Lugosi. You know, there, there are these things that they were clamoring to turn into film and stuff and now they sort of hit a wall and they're like well there's no more plays about creatures right now or whatever like how do what do we do what do we do and it's like I honestly don't know for this like why they didn't make Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde it is extremely close to that actual movie he even sort of looks like him and acts like him at one point but I definitely feel like next time around when we get the actual Wolfman movie like that's more of what I expect from Universal you know and I think that they pull it off much better there than they will here yeah definitely and and I think they knew what mistake they made with Werewolf of London because, you know, the next monster film they cranked out was another sequel, you know, so then it'll be sequels for a while until we get to The Wolfman. I think they were too afraid to venture out into unknown territory again and just kind of stayed with what they knew would sell. They knew Dracula and Frankenstein and the Invisible Man could get butts in seats. So, yeah, we won't see a Wolfman for a while. They'll almost sort of cobble together elements of those movies, like scenes will sort of repeat again in this movie. And it, it, it almost gave me the sense of a studio trying to guess what Universal would make for a monster movie, maybe. And they've also got some more of their weirder ideas that they want to flesh out, i.e. that plant stuff that I sort of hinted at earlier that I'm going to talk way more about later. And it's just like, oh, well, we'll make that killer plant movie in 25 years by Roger Corman, whatever, like fo- <laughs> focus, focus on the Wolfman thing right now. Like we gotta, we gotta do our universal dance and it's like, oh, what it is universal. It just feels like they're trying to beat themselves at some point. It's weird. I, I have to also suspect that with the Lamleys not really uh, involved in this film so much that all the best creative elements that made, you know, the, the first what, six movies in this um, franchise or the franchise, but you know, in this line of movies, like all of those got sort of sucked out of the room and Universal was like, we can do this without all those people. And I think they learned that they couldn't, but that didn't stop them from trying for a long time. 
this um, restructuring that happens within movie studios and on films becomes like headline news now when it probably didn't in the 30s. You know, these were just things that happened in, in, in uh, closed door offices, right? So I don't mean to suggest that none of this stuff ever like made news, but I don't think it was such big news. Whereas today, you know, that's why we have legions of people hounding a studio to release the director's cut. You wouldn't see that in the 30s. You might read it in a trade magazine or in the art section of a newspaper, you know, but it wouldn't be like on every blog and website. You know, there were they didn't exist yet so yeah things are very different today but yeah let's let's get into the movie i'm howling to get into the production <laughs> of uh werewolf of london as i said werewolves have existed for as, as long as human beings have been alive to tell stories but up until the 1930s there were very few films there were only like a couple of like short films none of them were particularly significant but in 1933 a novel came out the werewolf of paris by guy endor it was a popular enough novel that it inspired universal to add a werewolf Werewolf to its coterie of monsters. However, for some reason, I couldn't figure out why, Universal opted not to purchase the rights and, and base a screenplay off of that source, but to create an original treatment. They don't base the screenplay off of this novel, The Werewolf of Paris, but I thought it was kind of interesting that at the same time, Guy Endor was over at MGM co-authoring screenplays, uh, including Mark of the Vampire starring Bela Lugosi and Mad Love, which were both released in 1935. So the guy who wrote that novel was over at MGM GM at the same time writing other movies including a Lugosi vampire film which a lot of people view as sort of a spiritual sequel to Dracula. I read somewhere that Universal had planned a Wolfman starring Boris Karloff as early as 1932. That would have been directed by good old Robert Flory, but unfortunately this project never got off the ground. But then in late 1934, it was announced that Carl Newman would direct Werewolf of London, which would be produced by Robert Harris and star Henry Hull and Bela Lugosi. The idea of Bela Lugosi being in this movie just blows my mind, you know, like how they didn't keep him. Like I said before, I'm kind of underwhelmed by the, the principal actors in this movie. Bela Lugosi would have really brought some gravitas to that role, you know what I mean? Sort of the exotic werewolf character. I, I wish that they had kept Lugosi. This guy's not bad, we'll get there, but like, it just seems like at times certain actors are in different movies, if you catch my drift. Yes, <laughs> yes. But by mid-January, Kurt Newman had moved on to a different project and was replaced by Stuart Walker. Now, Stuart Walker had already directed two successful Dickens adaptations for Universal. He did Great Expectations in 1934, and he also did Mystery of Edwin Drood, starring Claude Rains. By the end of January 1935, Bela Lugosi was replaced by Swedish actor Warner Oland, who... Most people would be familiar with him for his years of playing Charlie Chan and Fu Manchu. He made, I think, 30-some Charlie Chan films. I definitely knew I recognized this guy. I've not seen those Charlie Chan movies, but uh, were those, like, before this, after this? Like, was he a big star already? Werewolf of London came out kind of at the beginning of his career as Charlie Chan. He had made a few Charlie Chan films before Werewolf of London, but then he also made quite a few after as well. As for Henry Hull, he was an accomplished stage actor he came from a family of performers and by the time he got into films like he was still primarily a, a stage performer and films were kind of his way to keep busy between his theater engagements so i don't know that he ever planned to like make it big as a movie star it was just a way for him to keep acting you know in between his stage performances which i thought was kind of interesting so he's kind of just like moonlighting as like a Hollywood actor. Yeah. In 1934, Carl Lamley discovered him and signed him to a five-year contract. He appeared in Stuart Walker's Great Expectations, so he had already worked with Stuart Walker, and then did Werewolf of London and appeared in a couple other projects around that time as well. He had been asked in the 60s if he had watched Werewolf of London, and I think he, he might have caught part of it. You know, he wasn't really too into the whole movie star thing, so he seemed like a pretty humble guy, though. But shortly after the announcement, that Henry Hull and Warner Oland would star in this film. Production began a couple days to a week later. Carl Lamley's son-in-law, Stanley Bergerman, was the executive producer. As again, John Colton was the playwright who wrote the screenplay. I mentioned before he would go on to write The Invisible Ray, starring Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. His shooting script for this was very dialogue heavy and really heavily emphasized the love triangle, which, I don't know if you noticed, kind of takes up a great deal of this movie. 
Yeah, hell yeah, I noticed. It's actually been a while since um, they leaned into, like, the romantic triangle stuff. You know, James Whale kind of wasn't having any of it in his last two movies. And it was, on one hand, kind of oddly kind of refreshing to see it again, but I loved how it was handled. We'll, we'll talk more about that when we talk about the plot and the film and everything like that, but, but I thought they found a kind of, like, a clever way to deal with all of that kind of stuff. I looked at my letterboxed review of this from a year ago, maybe two years ago. I can't remember the last time I watched this. And I don't know what movie I was watching at the time, but I had said that I felt like they could have expanded more on the sort of romantic element in the movie. I was watching it this week in preparation for the show, and I'm thinking, man, I just I want to get to the werewolf stuff. Why are we continuing to beat this dead horse that their marriage is failing because, you know, he's preoccupied with his work. Uh, yeah, it's the same old story. They're kicking the same horse to death, right? Like, he's spending all the time in the lab and he's pushing her away. But yeah, I just, I don't know how my perspective on this film changed in, in that short period of time. But yeah, this time around, I could only see the love triangle. But anyway, m many cuts were made to John Colton's script uh, in an effort to tighten things up. Here's something interesting that I read about his, his original script. He didn't really include any transitioning back and forth for Henry Hull as the werewolf, meaning that after his initial transformation, he would have stayed in makeup for the rest of the film. Oh, okay. I don't hate that idea. It's a one-time transformation, like you're stuck there. Especially this guy who can like drive a car if he wants to while he's a werewolf, which is <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, ultimately, I think that cutting a bunch of the material out was probably a good thing because it's already pretty dialogue heavy for a werewolf movie. Yeah, and there's all that genus species talk with the plant stuff. Like there's so much botany going on in this movie. Yeah, lot, lots of science. But so since we're talking about the makeup, though, let's get into that. I found that pretty interesting. Now, this is Jack Pierce doing the makeup, of course. I always thought that this was like his first attempt at werewolf makeup and that he like perfected it in The Wolfman when he did it on Lon Chaney. That's kind of half true. What I discovered is that the makeup design that Lon Chaney wore in The Wolfman was Jack Pierce's original makeup design for this. Really? So what did they, did they want him to like tone it down, show some more skin, less fur on the face kind of stuff? So this is where Henry Hull gets involved. So there's a couple different versions of the story and why things changed. Some people would say that it was vanity. He wanted to show his face through the makeup to some degree. He didn't want it all covered in, in hair. Mm -hmm. Another story is that he refused to sit in the chair for all the hours that it would take to apply all that stuff. Yeah, that's a rude awakening for a lot of actors. You know, I even you even hear that in interviews in modern day. Like, I didn't know I was going to be waking up at five in the morning to sit in a makeup chair for six and a half hours and then go make a movie for the rest of the day. He had a third story that I read, and this is this is coming from his great nephew, Cortland Hall. Supposedly, he was an accomplished makeup artist in his own right. I mean, he was a stage actor, so one could assume that he was doing his own makeup for the stage at the time, and that he saw that in the script, characters had to be able to recognize him as Wilford Glendon. So I think, it, you know, he just didn't see the logic in covering up his entire face and then having characters be able to identify him. Yeah, I would argue that this movie in particular kind of dropped the ball in the sense that we shouldn't be able to recognize him as that guy because there's supposed to be sort of two of these things running around and a bit of mistaken identity, perhaps. And while I think it's a cool design in its own right, it is kind of, it's more Teen Wolf than like Underworld. I still think when we get to the Wolfman, like it's, you hear it all the time. It's in the eyes, right? The performance mm -hmm. is in the eyes mm -hmm. and in the body. That's where the performance was in the previous creatures as well. Um, there's some really great shots of this makeup, though, like online. And it's not it's not a failure by any sense. It's just not what I expected. Yeah, right. It kind of looks more um, devilish than wolfish. Almost even um, like a vampire, I would say. Yeah, I mean, it, even the script references the fact that what he becomes is not really a wolf, not really a man. It's sort of satanic, right? More more than animalistic. I feel, um, I'm sorry to keep bringing it up, but it feels like Mr. Hyde again, you know? It just feels like it's yeah. his animal side and it's, you know, another face of his. 
Yeah, for sure, 100%. And, and I even get a tiny little dash of Lon Chaney in London after midnight. I mean, it's not real obvious. I don't know. I just, I, I see a little bit of that in this particular makeup design. I think it's the teeth. I think it's like the shark teeth kind of effect or something, you know? That's probably it, yeah. <laughs> so Jack Pierce, for anybody who has ever read or heard anything about Jack Pierce, was not really much of a pushover. Mm -hmm. And so when Henry Hull pushed back on his makeup design, he really resisted changing it. And it, it wasn't until Henry Hull went to Junior Lamley, like with his idea, that he was ultimately forced to concede and go with a different design that would show more of Henry Hull's face. In a pretty remarkable example of petty bullshit, Jack Pierce was so pissed about this that he did what he could to eliminate the need for Henry Hull in a couple of scenes by creating a life cast of his face and then applying the various stages of the werewolf makeup to the cast. So there's a couple scenes in this movie, like the transformations, where it's not actually Henry Hull, it is a life cast of him. I wondered in one in one transformation, he's sitting so still. I had wondered yeah. how they did that. And I guess that's that might be the answer. There, there's one extremely iconic transformation in this. I was I had forgotten was in this movie. But the one where the Wolfman is uh, he's like walking and he's transforming little by little as he walks past like these big pillars in the middle of the street. Mm -hmm. That's come up a few times throughout film and television history. I think there's a famous Twilight Zone with something about the devil where the guy is like, it's shot for shot and also like in x-men i think mystique transforms in the same manner so you know they still figured out ways for this to stand apart from other stuff with the special effects and the makeup effects oh for sure and those special effects here are credited to john p fulton who you know we talked at length about in the our invisible man episode he's back again doing the special effects here i learned some some of the things about his special effects here that i didn't really know before like for example you talked about the transformation sequence the famous one is where dr glendon transforms as he's walking through the scene the way they accomplish that it was very similar to how they accomplished some of the shots in The Invisible Man. They had Henry Hull walk across this black velvet backdrop so that they could superimpose a background behind him. And then they would just shoot him walking across in the various stages of makeup. And then they superimposed those giant pillars in the foreground so that he could walk behind them and that would sort of mask the edits, right? It's a pretty simple concept, but it plays really effectively here. You know, I, I love, I think this might be the greatest sequence if nothing else this sequence is the reason to watch werewolf of london you know like this is such a great well executed transformation sequence absolutely like that definitely stands apart and says like this film sort of earns its place in history with that sequence alone almost you know i'd say that yeah. maybe for the first appearance of audrey too we will we'll get there <laughs> yeah that is just like stuck in my mind like i'm so happy for this movie to contain that moment yeah and, and i don't even think the wolfman has a transformation as impressive as that i think by then they had sort of mastered werewolf transformation yeah it was just like guys sit in a chair as we slowly apply makeup and do like a time lapse and like we wouldn't really get a werewolf transformation that blew our pants off the, the next example that comes to my mind is is american werewolf in london rick yeah. baker's uh, werewolf transformation in that i could be forgetting something but that i mean those are the two werewolf transformations that really stand out in my mind as being iconic moments in horror history i can't think of anything in between though i love me my werewolf movies I just shout out to this from what i've learned a uh, not not very well known one called bad moon which uh incredibly grisly transformations i think the howling series has some remarkable practical effects when it comes to werewolves and stuff those movies are are insane and kind of incoherent at times but that's part of the fun i guess something about like werewolf communes and hippie werewolves and whatever but like yeah that's a lot of fun another special effect that i didn't really think about until i read about it is so what john fulton would do i guess in tandem with jack pierce is he would use red makeup right to create like different textures on henry hull's face and hands and whatnot and they would shoot him with a red filter on the lighting and then for the transitions they would remove the red filter shoot him under regular unfiltered light and then suddenly those areas that were you know covered in the red makeup would become more pronounced just a simple technique that i never even thought about 
There was a video circulating a few years ago online of like this um, very old effect shot of a woman aging rapidly. And that's the exact technique that they used. And people were like, how do they do this? This is insane. This is, looks like computer generated. It's like, no, it's all an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just, just a fun little effect there that I read about. It. And of course, before the movie was released to the public, they could not do so without the approval from the production code authority. The PCA added and subtracted some things from this film. They added a, quote, fear of God element into the opening sequence as Dr. Glendon is about to trek up into the mountains in uh, Tibet to find this plant. An old priest warns him that there are some things it is better to not bother with. They added that because at the time, because of the code and, and all that, movies like this, especially horror movies, needed to have some element of God in there to satisfy this religious agenda that they sort of had. So it was okay okay for Henry Hull to meddle with forces beyond our uh, understanding, but he couldn't do so without being justly punished for it. Right. Yeah. I.e. he had to die in the end, right? I think that's right. part of the message. It, yeah, it does feel a little bit like there's a quota to be met where um, like, OK, we've let you guys get away with a lot of well, not let you, but like we weren't around to stop you before. And so now we want you to sort of inject a little bit of like you could use religion, but it's got to be kind of the wholesome side. You know, we want you to use it as as like positive propaganda <laughs> instead of like these doctors trying to claim and be God. Now they're praying to God for like help to to get through this kind of stuff. Right, yeah, because there's that one point where Glendon is, is praying for salvation. I'm sure the PCA had something to do with that as well. They also removed quite a bit of the Glendon-Yogami fight in the climax due to its graphic nature. So, like, the one scene in the movie, which I felt like should have been a little more emphasized some more, they cut it up because it was too graphic. I feel like we were robbed a Wolfman versus Wolfman fight. We definitely were. We are clued in that there were two of them, and we just didn't see the other one the whole movie. I mean, you know, he lets on that it's him, but like, yeah, we needed to. It's like, put on that other makeup we had sitting on the side that you didn't want to use and just like, let's do it. Right. We will definitely get into that as we get through the film. But uh, one last thing that I thought you would find interesting because you mentioned at the top of the show, yeah, your distaste for the title of the movie. Before the movie was released, Carl Lemley offered a $50 prize to any employee who could come up with a snappy title based on the synopsis. Suggestions include Moon Doom. Whoa. Wait, Moon Doom? Yes. D-O-O-M. Moon Doom. Uh, the Relief of Death, Kismet, The Loose Wolf, Bloom Flower Bloom, and the only one that was seriously considered, The Unholy Hour. What is going on at Universal? Like, <laughs> just call it The Werewolf. What is yeah. wrong with you people? Why are they having so much difficulty? It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I, I have no idea. Like Again, like I said, the only one that was ever seriously considered was The Unholy Hour, which I don't hate. Well, I don't, I don't hear Warren Warren Zevo singing that quite as well, you know, Werewolf right. of London has a better <laughs> ring to it. A couple other cast members worth noting, Valerie Hobson as Dr. Glendon's wife, Lisa. We remember her from The uh, Bride of Frankenstein. She was Elizabeth in The Bride of Frankenstein. We've got Lester Matthews as Paul Ames. That's kind of it. Those are the important characters. We'll get into like side characters as we get through the film, I think. Okay. Yeah, so this is, I think, the first film in the Universal Monsters series that establishes that it takes place in that Earth in the Universal logo because we have the plane coming around as, as we, are, we normally see. We have the opening credits and then we get a zoom in on this like miniature globe model and we're zooming right in on Tibet. I, I have to imagine there's some continuity there. Like it's we're meant to believe it's the same Earth. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me, especially since I believe they bring it back at the end. Two characters take off together in an airplane at the end and then an airplane is seen flying around the Universal logo. I just thought that was a fun like little meta touch yeah you know like we mentioned earlier i think george lucas was watching these movies and there's that's indiana jones with the paramount logo right like it just it goes right into the movie out of the logo or something oh i think i think you're right yep yep he said he definitely does okay so we're we're in tibet 
Are we in Tibet, though? Because I just have to stop you real quick. I, I texted you immediately, and yes. I was like, Vasquez rocks. Can't believe it. You're waiting for Captain Kirk and the Gorn to, to fight down the side of the same exact cliff. I mean, granted, this is, you know, 30-some-odd years earlier than Star Trek, but I thought it was magnificent. I was like, oh, I'm so down with this. Like, I know it's not Tibet, <laughs> but I also know it's California. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I did read somewhere that they shot like all of the Tibet stuff like kind of out in the deserts of California. The specific location didn't jump out at me because like I'm just I'm not that familiar with Star Trek, but I love that they just repurposed the same little location. Well, actually, this would have been pre Star Trek. Yeah, it's pre Star Trek and it's in tons of stuff after and everybody kind of goes back to that one Star Trek episode. But now they have to go back even further to this movie. Hence, like right. it's earning its place even more. I mean, I, I can see that it's California, but not thinking about it, shot in black and white and it's nighttime. You know, I buy it as Tibet. looks pretty good. Yeah, it looks gorgeous. Yeah, it's it's really well shot. Especially when you have all of those like extras, you know, and you have the, the camel, everyone's sort of like wearing Asian clothing and, and whatnot. So, yeah, I think it totally works. I know. I also wondered if they're saying more than I'm aware of by having it take place in Tibet. I know that like, you know, growing up, they always heard, you know, free Tibet and there's lots of complications with China and stuff. But this was during a period where Tibet appears to have been independent, like an independent region. So, like, I almost wondered if this was like some kind of like uh, come to Tibet. It's like one of these new interesting places out in the world, almost like a travelogue kind of thing about mm -hmm. it. Because very soon after, like, I don't feel like people will be able to go there uh, easily. Again, not like an expert on any of this stuff. Just like it rang a bell in my head as to like interesting that they would go to Tibet. Yeah, it's also like not a region that you see very often, which I thought was really cool. Most movies that are sort of Asia centric, like you never, I mean, the only other movie that I can think of that is set in part in Tibet is Raiders of the Lost Ark. There's Indiana Jones again. You know, that scene with Marion is set in Nepal. I just love this as sort of like, it's it's Asian, but like, it's not China. It's not Japan. Like it's, a, it's an area we don't get to see quite as much. So I really love, I love that it feels a little more exotic. I think that might have been a, a thing about it, too. Like, all, all, all I ever really knew growing up were Tibetan monks, right? Like, that's kind of right. like my uh, association with, with the region and the area and stuff. And so, like, to find out that sort of where werewolves are going to be coming from also just messes with my brain a little bit. I was like, oh, weird that, like, we're here, but it's going to be sort of a ominous expedition. Right. It's ominous from the, almost from the get-go, right? They're surrounded by these, like, what do they have? They have, like, a crew of aides and whatnot at, at this camp. They're like Sherpas and stuff, right? Yeah. They meet this priest who's been living in those mountains for, like, what, 40 years? I think he says something. Like, they're like, you're the first white man we've seen in, in weeks. And he's like, you're the first white man I've seen in 40 years. He's been living up there for a long time. And when Glendon asks him for some assistance in trying to locate the this rare plant, the Marifesa lupina lumina, the priest kind of warns him like, hey man, you don't want to go messing with this. There's stuff up in these mountains you don't want to, you know, you don't want to deal with. But Glendon being a man of science can't imagine there's anything to fear, of course. So he journeys forward anyway. This I thought was a little bit strange. So he's, he's accompanied by an assistant that he brought with him from England. On their climb up these mountains, they sort of both encounter almost a supernatural force that is trying to stop them from what they're doing did you catch this oh yeah he's like i can't lift my foot yeah i thought he was just scared i didn't get the sense that that there was anything actually holding him back well i thought that too until glendon is in like in the very next sequence he sort of has like a spell of sorts so yeah it's it's very vague and it kind of feels a little bit out of place because there's like there's no other mention of it it doesn't show up anywhere else in the movie it's just this one little sequence do you think maybe they were trying to get into some kind of climbing thing with like their lack of oxygen or or something like they're getting high up the mountain and it's like, oh, I can't feel my legs or like, I can't, you know, I'm getting dizzy. It could be, but like when, I know when Glendon has his moment, he sort of hits the rock behind him and says, something struck me. So I think, the, I think the implication is that something supernatural is trying to intervene, but there's really no 
other explanation for it. I just thought it was a strange addition to this particular sequence, but... Hey, yeah, I did mention that there were going to be sort of loose threads uh, from time yeah, to time. Yeah, you sure did. But they do find the plant. Of course, it's blooming in the moonlight, and Glendon hurries to get a sample of it. And as he does so, a strange kind of beast from behind a rock jumps forward and attacks him. We don't really get a good look at this thing. It, it appears like a man, but also has kind of animal features and it bites Glendon but Glendon is is able to fight it off and make his way back to London with his cutting can we spoil it now like is that supposed to be Yogami yes okay we find out at the end that the creature that attacked him was Dr. Yogami yeah, I don't know that that's Warner Oland in the makeup. It doesn't really look like him. I mean, we only see him from the eyes up. But I don't think it's him. I mean, it could be, but I don't think it is. Because I don't think we see Yogami truly in makeup at all in this movie. And I just got to say that the flower, like, way different than I was expecting. Like, for some reason, I thought it was just going to be like a little flower. But isn't it? It's like some big, long thing on a stalk kind of situation. <laughs> it looks pretty alien. Yeah, and it's not the last alien flower we're going to see in the movie either. But it is bizarre. Uh, it almost looks like they um, went to, you know, and got some artificial flowers, like different styles of artificial flowers, and then created a hybrid. Because, I mean, when you, when you see close-ups of this thing, it looks like an artificial flower, unfortunately. But from a distance, I mean, it looks kind of cool. But it definitely looks like it's got little pieces of other familiar plants, and they've just sort of put them all together to create this weird alien-looking thing. So the other thing about this scene that really drove something home to me was, uh, and I, and if you know, we don't have to talk about all of this right now. We could save some of it for later. But um, werewolves and wolfmen. To my understanding, this movie is going to be what is more commonly referred to as wolfmen. And that the werewolf will sort of completely transform into the wolf form. Four legs, run around, no clothes on. Right. Kind of like completely out of its mind. Whereas um, in this movie especially, it's going to be like wolfman goes to work, right? Like he's going to put on a hat. <laughs> he's going to put on a jacket. Like, he's going to get dressed up to go out at one point. Throughout the years, he's going to become more feral, but, like, anytime he's standing on two feet bipedal, he's a wolf man. Anytime he's running around on all fours, he's a werewolf dude. I just kind of wanted to get that out of the way a little early, and this was, since this is the first time we're going to see a thing, I thought I could bring it up. Yeah, for sure. I never really thought about the distinction between a werewolf and a wolf man, but you're absolutely right. Again, and I think this is, be again, because this is uh, the first real attempt at a werewolf-type move, Movie, that was the word that they were going to be using. So fortunately, they changed it for the next Wolfman movie. And, you know, because he is a Wolfman, not a werewolf. Although, you know, the rules kind of seem the same for both. It, I guess it really just comes down to the design of, of the creature. You know, is it, a, is it a man, a bipedal man? And I could be off base, you know, to a degree as well. Like, I don't think that there's anything written in stone about any of this. You know, it's all fantastic and fictional and fantasy stuff. So I just want to say that as well. It's not like this was written in, like, according to Hoyle's Book of Monsters or anything <laughs> like that. Oh, for sure. For sure. I just, uh, I, I love the distinction. Glendon gets back to his home lab and he's found a way to manufacture artificial moonlight, which I think is pretty interesting. You know, that actually is another great point. His lab has a few things in it that seem pretty futuristic or are just like pure science fiction, right? Like, I, I don't think even to this day we can manufacture moonlight, right? I, I thought that was really neat that he had uh, a machine that could, like, that's like the magic in this movie, right? It's... Yeah, because just the concept would, sounds like it would make sense. Like, you can fake sunlight. Why couldn't you fake moonlight? <laughs> So I, I love that. And then I also love that he's got what appears to be kind of like an early version of one of those doorbells people have today where like have a little video screen. He's got a home security system, basically. Like he's got cameras at the door and he's got a monitor inside and he can see like who's outside. Like this is crazy futuristic. Yeah, but like in those like subtle ways, which I think is really cool. In, in the ways that you're like, why doesn't this matter more? Like I want more of this. <laughs> like this is another thread that's like, oh, oh shit, is he going to have like all this crazy technology around the house? And like, is he also sort of like a tinkerer in this? And, but like, no, 
I was a little let down by that. I thought we would see sort of the house of the future or something. <laughs> yeah, I think that you definitely sort of underlined ways that Glendon could have been like a really interesting, complicated character. It like really highlights to me how much he is not any of those things in this movie. Yeah, so his lab is really cool. He's researching, or I'm sorry, he's studying this plant and trying to get it to bloom. It's not blooming. But of course, he gets pulled away by uh, his wife, Lisa, so that they can attend a botanical society party at his home. And we get to see one of the really cool parts of his house, which is this giant greenhouse full of like tons of exotic plants. So now we, we really get a sense of just how big league he is in terms of like the world of botany. Because like people refer to him as like this famous botanist and he has this sort of reputation. But now we can see why, right? He's got like a whole giant garden of weird and exotic plants in his home. Yeah, which I've got so many incredibly insane questions about this guy. Just in general, this guy guys like plants and like him as a botanist and like as a scientist do you think like he might have made some of these plants and like crossbred some of this stuff because they talk about at one point how it's like it's so close like I can't tell if it's a plant or an animal we're seeing stuff like Venus flytraps but then we see this thing that eats a frog <laughs> okay, and I'm sorry, but this is horrific. It's like some kind of spider plant, sarlacc looking thing that like gave me a nightmare last night. Like I could not believe this. Like I couldn't believe this was in this movie and that this didn't have its own movie to like take over the world. And, uh, you know, very little shop of horrors type stuff in my mind going on right now at this garden party. They talk about how that plant eats mice and spiders. And at one point they feed it a frog. And like, I was sure that Lisa's aunt's little dog was going to end up in that plant. Yeah, like you think it's going to get loose at the end and fight the werewolf. <laughs> I would have loved to see that movie. But those are the kinds of threads and things I'm talking about. Like, we've hit a couple now in, like, the first act, and none of this stuff is really going to resurface later. It's all it's all going to be about the antidote, and it kind of becomes a slasher flick. Yeah. We'll get into that a little bit, but, like, it just becomes a lot of, like, murders. For sure. And we do get introduced to a couple uh, of, actually, I think the rest of the major players in this sequence. Of course, we meet Lisa, and we get to get a sense of her relationship with Dr. Glendon and, and how they're relationship is really starting to deteriorate because of the amount of time he's spending on his research. And then, of course, in the same scene, she is reunited with an old friend, an old flame named Paul Ames. And he is sort of an accomplished man as well. Glennon sort of alludes to his notoriety a little bit. I, I think he's clearly established as another successful man in Lisa's life. Is he a journalist? I thought at one point he's using his deductive skills with the police and then later I thought he was getting chewed out by an editor, but I could have been totally wrong. The movie doesn't spend a whole lot of time on him. I think you're, I think you're right about that. But uh, we also meet Eddie Coombs, who is Lisa's goofy, flighty aunt. She's like the fun aunt that everybody wants. Who like she can't remember anybody's names. She's just seems drunk all the time. Cause she is drunk. She's hammered in this movie. Just a quick thing about this like garden party scene with the social lights and high society and everything. This is not the satire that we get with like James Wales insight. I don't even know that they're going for that. To me, this almost feels like a more kind of honest depiction of that type of social circle uh, at the time. You know, like they're not really poking too much fun at too much of what's happening at this event. They only kind of like, it's mostly Eddie who like takes the brunt of a lot of the, you know, joking and things like that. So I was wondering how you felt about that with this scene. Like, do you think they're going for that definitely later with the old ladies like they're going for james wales type of stuff but it just doesn't have the same subtlety um did you pick up on any of that during this sequence yeah i mean uh especially the two older women later but definitely here it feels like they wanted to channel some of that james whale high society like comedy of manners kind of thing but it plays much more straight here whereas james whale was able to make it sort of a, a biting satire yeah I think if this weren't played so straight, it would be more effective. But it's it seems like the poor man's James Whale comedy. That doesn't mean I don't enjoy it, but it definitely lacks the uh, like the teeth that something James Whale would have put up on the screen. Right. Yeah. It didn't seem that they wanted to be too offensive. Is how it kind of comes across. Whereas James Whale's like wants to offend people sometimes. Yes. 
Okay, so this scene, uh, as I said, introduces all of these characters. We are also introduced officially to Dr. Yogami, who crashes this party. And he knows that Dr. Glendon has returned from Tibet with a sample of this magical flower. And, like, really wants to get his hands on a piece, you know, or figure out what Dr. Glendon is doing with it to replicate this plant. We don't know yet why he is so interested, but I believe in this scene, Dr. Yogami mentions that he met Glendon once in the dark in Tibet. It becomes a running joke with Yogami. Everyone's like, I feel like I've met you before. And he's like, possibly once in passing. <laughs> and like, I think at one point he even like touches Glendon's arm. Maybe it's not in this scene, but he definitely like, Yogami really hammers this point home. Like he all but says, I'm the other werewolf. <laughs> I mean, he even, he, he, he has, he busts out the term werewolfery at one point. Yes. And it's like, come on, dude. But Dr. Glendon's like, oh, that's medieval horse crap right like he's not a believer he, he can't get on board but i do appreciate you know we don't really get that much in movies where a guy will approach someone with a problem and tell him almost exactly what it is where dr yogami is kind of like dude read between the lines like i'm saying everything except like if i said anything else the movie would be over right now you know take a hint yeah, and, and I gotta say that Warner Oland just does not seem into the material, like just to step out of the scene for a second. Glendon is okay. I think his character is not really uh, all that well written. He's doing as the best he can with this material. But Yogami is like, should be this sort of exciting, mysterious, exotic villain. And Warner Oland looks like he's sleepwalking through a lot of these scenes. Did you, did you feel that at all? Or is that just me? I don't know that I'd say it had that same feeling. What I felt was that this was the guy who's in a different movie. Like, he feels way more sort of cartoonish, maybe even more kind of developed internally as a character. Like, more of like what I was expecting to find in this movie, to be honest. I didn't really get the sense that he wasn't, like, comfortable in the role because the character is playing uncomfortable the entire movie, you know? So it's kind of hard. It was kind of hard for me to think of it like that. I think it would have been a little easier on the character and the audience if at times he wasn't kind of played off like as a racial stereotype you know like I feel like they clearly named him Yogami to be exotic there's at times in the movie he's also going to be referred to as I think Dr. Yokohama so there's sort of this joke where they can't tell if he's Japanese or Chinese and, and that's sort of off-putting I mean he's a Swedish American actor again like these are still like the Al Jolson days of films like you know I feel like this is better than a lot of stuff out there it's tough you know, I, I just kind of, it didn't bother me in, in the sense I think it bothered you, but it, to me, it, he just felt like he was in a different Wolfman movie. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, we should say that, uh, yeah, he's a Swedish American actor uh, and claimed that, like, as he would frequently play Asian characters, like, as I mentioned, he was Charlie Chan. He also played Fu Manchu. He uh, claimed that his sort of vaguely Asian appearance was product of sort of Mongolian heritage like on his mother's side or something like that so i don't know how true that is that was his claim if this were bella lugosi it still would be a little problematic and that he was hungarian right he wasn't asian but the character were reworked and lugosi had played this character then i could see the character being like way better yeah, I could even see, you know, this actor portraying this character better if he's playing it more as like a Van Helsing who got bit. Right. Lean into the Swedish accent and do that kind of stuff. And if you're going to be a stereotype, at least, you know, play it off of your own heritage, I guess. I don't know. I think he could have gone in a different direction and this um, character could have been just as successful, if not more. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so as the scene plays on, we get a really good sense of who Yogami is. Like I said, he all but says out loud that he was the other werewolf in Tibet who attacked Dr. Glendon. And then we also kind of get this love triangle, right? We, we sort of discussed it a little bit before, but like this is where we meet Paul Ames and his relationship with Lisa. And like they go back and forth between Yogami and then this love triangle. And it's very clear that Lisa is still like, still has feelings for Paul and that makes uh, Glendon very jealous like this stuff goes on for way longer than I think it needed to I like how it's kind of laced throughout the movie though because it's almost as if they're reconnecting and going on their own journey while Glendon's going off and doing his thing you know he proposed to her when they were like six and uh, he's even like and I would surely do it again this very moment and Val and Lisa's like 
oh, you know, I, I, I don't think of you that way or whatever anymore. And he's like, yes, I know. I was just joking, of course. And I took that as, a, as like a bit of a lie. Ultimately, they do end up together, right? And she gets divorced, I would assume. I mean, her husband dies. She, he was a werewolf that gets shot. Like, I like how it was framed. Like, at least this wasn't a guy who was always hanging around waiting to put his foot in the door. Like, this is an old friend from back in the day. He, he's a pilot now. He flew here on his own from America. Like, he's very impressive. Like, all this, like, look at me. I'm sort of this self-made man now. Like, I kind of appreciated that type of angle you know what i'm getting at like at least like it's not as familiar as it used to be yeah i actually really like the chemistry between valerie hobson and lester matthews i thought they were fine i think the only other thing i would change maybe is instead of lester matthews like this is a role that'd be perfect for david manners he was john harker in dracula and he was in the mummy as well like i feel like this is that sort of character he wanted to play but he always kind of got stuck with these like weaker versions of that character you know what i mean yeah and just on that note like both these actors henry hull and lester matthews seem way sort of um maybe, I want to say older, but way more distinguished than like the previous sort of love interests, I guess, you know, like there always was sort of more of like a, uh, like a naive or a younger edge to the guy who was like in contest uh, for the woman. I love the sort of family dynamic. I love Aunt Eddie. Who am I forgetting? Oh, Lady Forsyth, who is um, Dr. Glendon's aunt, or she's related to him in some way, but she's sort of the older... The matriarch, right? Yeah, she's she's that character. And I, I just I kind of love all that interplay. Like I said, it's not quite James Whale levels of, of, of social commentary, but I do think that it's fun. Yeah, there's some stuff there. It feels like kind of messing with like the royals almost to me. Oh, yeah. Right? Like that's what it ultimately came across as. And I think it does a good job in that effect. Once the party is over, Glendon is back in his lab with his assistant there, still trying to get this flower to bloom. He's experimenting with other nocturnal plants that bloom under moonlight. But for whatever reason, this Marifesa plant is not blooming. But this scene is actually really cool in that we get to see like the beginning of the transformation. In the scene prior, which I, I forgot to mention this, this is one of the more important details, Dr. Yogami mentions that the plant is significant in that it can act as an antidote to what he refers to as werewolfery. So in this scene here, we get to see Glendon, his hand it changes in the artificial moonlight that he's created. And we get to see the plant do its thing. He cuts off the bloom and then rubs the stem onto his hairy hand. And then the hair disappears. So we get a little like taste of, of werewolf stuff in this scene, which I thought was pretty cool. I love all the fringe science going on <laughs> in this. Like we're using plants to cure a curse it's why it's like the x-files but i also love how doesn't yogami say like it's not a cure it's an antidote like you gotta keep doing this the idea is if we could join forces maybe we could find a cure but like everybody is slowly going insane again and like very untrustworthy and trying to keep a secret and doesn't want anyone to know and everything so too many secrets being kept yeah that's true we do establish that there's no cure for lycanthropy right i don't think there's ever really been a movie that presented a cure uh, other movies in the universal canon uh, which we'll get to where some men believe they have a cure for the most part in werewolf movies once you're bitten you are a werewolf until you are dead you know there's no cure for it but this plant is an interesting solution to that problem in that if you can use the plant before your transformation then you will not transform for that evening but that means that you need to propagate this plant indefinitely for the rest of your life so that you always have access to this antidote I think this is where Yogami could have really shined as a villain because he just wants that plant for himself. He's not interested in a, in a sort of like a partnership. And I think this, this character was so underwritten and had so much potential to be like a really cool villain. But yeah, like that's his whole angle, right? He's not interested in joining forces. He's interested in stealing that plant. I think that would have been interesting if he steals the plant and then it's the ticking clock. I got to get the plant back before I transform, you know? And then the whole thing with the plant is that it only blooms in the moon in a full moon you have like a month you have a couple of days in a month in which to actually prune this plant you know to like get a flower from it or whatever so like it's all super time sensitive you know it's like is the flower gonna bloom in time before i turn into a werewolf so that i could get the antidote for another 30 days it's like oh my gosh it's so nerve-wracking <laughs> right 
So yeah, we get a little taste of, of the werewolf transformation. We know the full moon is coming. Glendon is still not totally convinced. You know, he has seen it happen in front of his own eyes, but like he's still not totally convinced. So we cut to a scene. Another, It's another scene with uh, Lisa and Aunt Eddie and Paul. And we discover that Eddie is going to be planning this like huge soiree that evening and is inviting everybody. So that sets up the action for the evening. We know that Glendon is going to most likely transform and he's probably going to attack this party, right? Because I think Yogami had told him that when you transform into a werewolf, your instinct is to kill the thing you love most. Right. So we know everyone's sort of on this like collision course to end up at this party later in the evening. You know what what would be really funny if like taking that concept, because that's I like that idea that like you're going to be on instinct and like you you just you destroy what you love. Kind of that's that's just a very big theme in a lot of these monster movies. Right. Like so I like that idea of like you're going to hone in on the thing you love the most and and you're going to kill her or it or him or whatever. And like I was thinking, what if he doesn't attack his wife but he attacks like his mom right the thing he really loves the most and he kills her right like by accident like you don't know that would have been a cool way to kind of write it or maybe in the future if you're going to take that concept somewhere that would have been a fun twist and i was almost expecting that i was like oh he doesn't he's not in love with his wife anymore who's he gonna kill first like who's he gonna target these are sort of missed opportunities which this movie's full of unfortunately but yeah i think that would have been a great way to go so that evening, instead of going to this party, Glendon has decided he's going to do some studying. He does some research into lycanthropy or what they call lycanthrophobia. And while he does that, Yogami returns and secretly uh, snips off the two remaining blooms on the, the Marifesa plant. And now with Lisa out at this party with Paul Ames, which they have a little bit of friction before, like on their way out the door, which is just adding more to this like love triangle element. The more Lisa tries to be a part of his life the more he is like lashing out and driving her further into the arms of paul she's becoming like way more assertive herself throughout the movie and like independent i noticed because later when he knows he's going to transform he begs her to stay home and she's like i'm gonna do whatever i want like i don't listen to you anymore yeah i did notice that she she kind of puts up with a lot right she really like she loves him and really wants to make this relationship work but but yeah by the end she's like you know what do whatever you're gonna do i'm gonna go riding whenever the hell i want and i and i kind of liked that yeah i like that a lot i mean you know he brings home a freaking frog eating plant one day and you're still sticking around it's like i would have jumped ship that night I think this character works so much better than her performance as Elizabeth in Bride of Frankenstein. I think just for her specifically, she's given more to do here. Yeah, and she carries herself much better. Like, that's another thing. It's like body language just, you know, means so much. And I think if you watch her performance, like, she stands very strong in this film. Like, physically, she's kind of an imposing presence when she's on screen. For sure. Yeah, definitely. So now with Lisa and Paul on their way to the party, Glendon experiences his first transformation. And like we were saying, this is the iconic sequence in this film. It's probably the best scene in the whole movie. But I love how it starts where he's sitting down in that like armchair with the cat and the cat just notices something's different, starts hissing, swatting, growling. Is that in Hotep's cat? I was thinking of all the great cat acting in the Universal Monster movies. So yeah, so now we've got the transformation and Glendon immediately like realizing what's happening, rushes to his laboratory to get to the Marifesa plant. And this is the sequence where we see him transform. And like we, I've already sort of discussed how they shot it, but it, it's just so well executed, I think. I love it, man. Like I said, I thought it only went as far back as the Twilight Zone. I wonder how many other, you know, shows have lifted this sequence in this shot because uh, I'm sure it's, there's a lot more out there. Oh, definitely. So he gets to his lab to find that all of the blooms on his marifesa have been snipped mysteriously. They're gone. And now he is stuck as a werewolf and, and has to kill somebody or else he will remain afflicted. So this is one of those things that I don't fully understand in terms of like werewolf rules. They definitely don't have it all fleshed out in this movie either. I don't think a plant is ever really going to... I mean, I think Wolfsbane comes back at some point because Wolf is in the name of it. But I don't know that, you know, 
plants or this particular plant will play a very predominant role in the future. Right. Here, I found the passage. So in, in his reading, it says, Unless the rare flower is used, the werewolf must kill at least one human being each night on the full moon or become permanently afflicted. So I don't really understand what that means. So if he doesn't kill somebody, does he just stay in wolf form permanently? That could be the thing. In order to turn back, he has to draw blood, probably. I mean, that's the problem with, like, a curse or magic. or they, Like, it could get real vague and wishy-washy at times and just be what it needs to be. And that's right. why I kind of like later on with the next Wolfman, like we are going to kind of have more concrete rules, I would say. One thing I think is pretty cool about this one is that it establishes the full moon is an element here because we'll discuss it when we get to the Wolfman. But the full moon didn't become uh, a necessary element for Lon Chaney's Wolfman until his second appearance. The poem that is recited about when the wolfbane blooms and, and man of pure heart and blah, 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 like all that stuff. Uh, it was changed to include the wording of a moon that is full and bright, but not in the original. So the full moon is not a constant thing in terms of universal werewolves. Now still... Stuck as a werewolf for the time being and having to find a solution for this problem, Glendon immediately grabs his cape and a hat and is like full Mr. Hyde mode here as he goes out on the town in search of Lisa, really, right? Because he's got a, he's, he's instinctively trying to kill the thing he loves most. So we cut back to this party, which is like the most ridiculous, rich white people bullshit party I've ever seen. It's just like a bunch of rich, drunk white people singing and, and and just having a good time. I learned something at this party. I learned that when people say they're on the wagon, I always wondered why, you know, when people stopped drinking, why they would say, I'm on the wagon. And in this movie, someone tells uh, Eddie that you should go get on the water wagon. So I'm assuming that's where the phrase came from. They used to say, get on the water wagon instead of the booze wagon. I don't know, oh, interesting. But, like, but I guess that's maybe we're on the... And earlier, earlier, the same character says old wives tale. And I had always thought it was an old wise tale. And so more confirmation. <laughs> Thank you, movie, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm just saying, Dan, these highbrow dinner parties are not without some worth. Okay, I learned something. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I don't think I caught the um, the water wagon line. I'll, I Now I'm curious to look into that. So we get to enjoy character moments, right? Like this scene largely exists to let these characters kind of be entertaining and, and be a little bit silly. Dr. Yogami appears, which... Do we really know why he's at this party? I think he's looking he's looking for Glendon. Like he was invited, but like maybe yeah, is he really just there to keep an eye out for Glennon? Yeah, and he also has um, a piece of flour, right? So he can kind of socialize for the time being and like do whatever, you know, without worrying. And I think, yeah, he knows there's going to be an attack. So he kind of wants to be there for it. Well, Glendon is on his way to this party. And just as they are putting Aunt Eddie down, you know, she's had too much to drink. And so the men carry her upstairs. Or, I'm sorry, not the men, but uh, Lisa and Paul, they take her upstairs and sort of put her to bed for the evening. And in the background, through like much of this, we hear the howling of Glendon in the background, um, which is always like just a great effect. I know it's so simple and it's such a cliche for these movies, but I just love a werewolf howl. Don't get enough of those. I got to be honest. I didn't love this werewolf howl. No. I think my problem is I'm so used to, you know, the token wolf howl, the howl, you know, the really long yeah. howl and everything um, accompanied by like more joining in, I guess, that it was like off-putting a bit but I guess that's the point like it still felt very human to me I guess I just expected it to be more booming and it's almost more of just like a like a warning or so you know what I'm saying like it comes almost more as like a like an alarm or something like that to me than like a it sounds inhuman but it doesn't quite sound like like a wolf exactly I don't know I'm kind of talking myself into liking it more though <laughs> I see what you're saying, and, and I think that if this particular werewolf character weren't so human already, I might agree. Okay. But I think because yeah. this particular version of a werewolf is already, like, very human to begin with, I, I kind of like that there's still some human in the howl. I mean, that might be a completely accidental choice, you know, like... That just might be the, how we can justify it. Maybe they were really going for like a real wolf howl and this is what they got. But I, th I think it works considering how much of a hybrid 
he is as this monster. Yeah, I, I definitely accept that. I guess I guess I was just thinking, you know, early days are maybe not so much now, but like we're we're in like these experimental times of sound film. I thought maybe they would try and go for something like really crazy, and I was just a little underwhelmed in the moment. I was like, oh, they're scared of that, like that. That doesn't sound like too bad. Also, you have to keep in mind that a, a noise like that, even a, a normal wolf howl, would seem foreign in a city. You know, like in London, it would be a very unusual sound to hear. That's true, too. Definitely. Good point. Yeah, I don't I don't have any complaints there as far as the howl is concerned. I think that it actually works pretty well. All right. It's a very predominant part of the film, so I just wanted to bring that up real quick. Oh, yeah. We hear that howl a ton. <laughs> Glendon climbs to the terrace for Aunt Eddie's home and sneaks into her bedroom where she's passed out. Fortunately, she comes to just as he is entering the bedroom and lets out this blood curdling scream. And then suddenly, you know, all the guys rush up the stairs and like one of them says, don't let any women up. Very 1930s. We can't let women see this. There's a moment where the wolfman or sorry, there's a moment when the werewolf is coming through the window and it's a point of view shot. And that is the smallest taste of what you could expect from the opening of that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde movie. Just picture that, but like, you know, for a couple minutes. I thought that was used to great effect. I thought that was an amazing moment, and that scream is incredible. Yeah, I think that particular sequence is put together really well. I mean, now we've got Glendon, like, really cast in shadow, right? And he just, he looks much more terrifying in that scene. Yeah, he's casting that giant wolfman shadow on the wall. Very cool. We don't get a lot of that expressionistic sort of uh, backdrop this time around so it was nice to see some of that come out yeah we got we got a little bit of that in the opening scene uh when they're in tibet when he's about to, to trim his the cutting of the of the marafaza plant you know when um yogami attacks him but yeah we get more shadow here i think that the shadows work really well here because the makeup can only do so much to make this character seem like an animal i think that goes for just about every makeup job like i think they were really trying to use light as the final sort of coat of paint whenever they were doing these creature features and stuff well i mean mean more so like casting shadow on the wall you know having that sort of creeping silhouette that works better here than i think you know in in like with other monsters i'm surprised they didn't do a cast shadow gag with the invisible man right like because if you shine light on him he's still gonna cast a shadow won't he i don't know it never occurred to me (laughs) sorry that's another discussion that's an (laughs) all-fair discussion (laughs) Over a couple beers. <laughs> of course, Glendon retreats. He escapes out through the window. Everyone thinks Eddie is dreaming or hallucinating or, you know, she's drunk. She doesn't know what the hell she's talking about. And so Glendon takes to the streets and murders. It's a young woman. We could assume that she's a prostitute. We don't really know. I've heard some people refer to her as a prostitute. She could just be a woman walking home. Who knows? That's what I wrote down. Not only that, but he encounters one earlier too that gets away from him right he's on his like way to the party and this woman like she is dancing down the street and like approaches him and and everything and then there's another woman at the zoo which is also a prostitute like Uh i don't i don't think that these women are not supposed to be thought of as prostitutes to be honest like i think there's something like they're gonna die because you know the ratings board is like nope you can't do that like you gotta die or whatever i think there's something going on underneath all that right yeah because of the the code really we can't know for sure because they wouldn't allow explicit information that would tell us they're prostitutes remember in dracula the woman he kills like she's selling flowers on the street but like that has to be a euphemism right selling your flower on the street (laughs) <laughs> that's just a clever way to get around saying that definitely could be like what i love about this particular kill sequence is how much it resembles like jack the ripper vibes you've got like a foggy um cobblestone street and he's like propped up in this like stairwell hiding his face you know of course the, the death happens off screen but but yeah we get our first real death in the whole movie which i think is a pretty good scene overall We cut back to Dr. Yogami, who is still kind of like trying to figure out what to do because he's only got one bud left. He has that scene with his uh, with his maid who like loves flowers and he kind of freaks out because she touches it. But yeah, he's not really sure what he's going to do yet either, right? Because he has to figure out a way to propagate this plant himself. So it's just a small scene, doesn't really push the story forward too much. But then we go back to Scotland Yard. We meet with Sir Thomas Forsyth. He is like the top cop in England. Sergeant Nicholas Angel, basically. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, it's his job to figure out 
who who murdered this young woman and this is yeah this is the scene where paul ames just happens to be in his office i don't think they ever really explain why i'm not totally sure what their relationship is that he would just be there yeah we've established he's a pilot he's not a reporter i thought he was a reporter at one point maybe he is posing as a reporter but yeah he's just kind of at the police station meddling in police business <laughs> he's basically like well it's clearly a werewolf and they're like what like how did you possibly come to that deduction werewolves are from fairy tales he's like oh no no one takes me seriously <laughs> He, he heard a story about like something that happened in South America, right? That seemed very similar to what happened in England the night before. And so, yeah, he's the first to suggest that maybe it's a werewolf or at least that they should entertain the possibility of that. And suddenly Eddie's story about the monster that attacked her suddenly doesn't seem so far fetched. So then we have a little more with Glendon and Lisa. Lisa is planning to go for a ride with Paul later that evening and invites Glendon to come with them. And of course, Glendon's like, I'm too busy, I can't do that. But then she ultimately sort of wears him down and, and he's reeling how much of an asshole he's being and decides he's going to come too. Until he realizes that they are going to be riding and there is a full moon that evening. And then he suddenly cancels those plans. And this is the scene we were talking about where he's like, you're, you're not going to go riding any night. There's a full moon. And she says, oh, yeah, I'm going to go riding whenever I want. Yeah, the communication has broken down to the degree that, like, she knows he's keeping something. He won't confide in his wife. Uh, it's pushing her into the arms of another man that loves her dearly and isn't lying to her, any of that kind of stuff. And it's like, man, if he just kind of explained himself better, but then the movie would be over in this sequence and we can't be having that yet but it's just kind of the thing where it's like neither of you guys should be going out riding tonight you know like i don't care if i hate you paul i don't want you dead you know like i don't <laughs> want to maul you to death or anything like that so it's just really interesting how like you can tell different things are on the minds of these characters and they're just not in sync whatsoever no, you're, you're right, though. I mean, I, if, if I were Glendon in this situation, I would have at least tried to explain things. I'm sure Lisa would not have believed him or thought he was crazy. But I mean, he doesn't even try. Instead, he's going to sort of pull uh, an invisible man here for a while and, and go hide out somewhere to try and not hurt anybody. Yeah, the next scene, he goes to this inn in what appears to be a sort of a nasty little part of town. I think sort of like in universe, it would be funny if they went to the like they revisited that same inn that uh, Griffin went to because we, we are almost going to get like the sisters of the innkeeper of that movie coming up in this sequence. Yeah, so this sequence has like all the best background characters. I think we get Mrs. Moncaster and Mrs. Wack who are sort of rival landladies. So when, when Glendon appears at this inn looking for a, a room to stay in, he's directed into this other room where these two women are eating tripe. Tripe is a very cheap meal because it's essentially cow stomach. So it's, you know, one of those sort of less desirable cuts from a cow and very popular with the poor people. So that's just a little detail to the scene to, to underline how sort of disreputable this establishment is. I mean, we also have that amazing drunk woman who orders two shots of gin for two ladies. She's a full on cartoon character at the bar. It's a, a, an amazing person. I love her. I love that the best character actors in this movie are all women, you know, like all of them. So much fun. But I have I have a, another question for you because I'm. What's up? I want to love this part, but the stuff with like Mrs. Wack and everything and, and, and Miss Moncaster, it just, it reeks of like Una O'Connor, right? Like, it's just like, sure. why have one when you can have two? And it's like, yeah, but like James Whale, he had a way of doing this where I just feel like this director's hand is extremely heavy when it comes to tone shifts and things like that. Like, he doesn't have the grace, I guess, flowing back and forth the way James Whale's did, where like, I feel the majority of this movie has been like the mummy like very serious for the most part and now we're getting literally hit in the face with like slapstick stuff right one of these women is gonna like 
punch the other in the heart and I think that she's like gonna die for a few minutes and like that's the <laughs> joke you know, it's just very awkward to me at this point I was not expecting to go in this direction did you kind of experience any disorientation the way I did not really I, I actually found it to be kind of a welcome reprieve from a lot of the melodrama I don't think it's executed as well as James Whale would have I mean we've we've kind of established that about all of these comedic moments I think that's true of this scene as well I think it's consistent throughout but I do love these characters Glendon is such a heavy character like he's a he's a lot to deal with as an audience member like he's so serious he doesn't have these like dramatic flares you know like the way that Griffin did in the Invisible Man where he would have these moments of calm these moments of mania you see that in Frankenstein as well and Bride of Frankenstein you see like much more dynamic characters and I don't think Glendon is that dynamic of a character he's just always miserable and he's not even charming Right. I say to people all the time that Larry Talbot is like the, the biggest sad sack in the Universal Monsters movies. He's always struggling to, to hang on to the will to live, you know? I think he just always wants to die, and that's a lot to, to deal with as an audience member too, but I think he has like a boyish innocence to him, like a charm that makes him sympathetic. Glendon, is, when he's not struggling with his werewolfery, he's being an asshole to people, so it's hard for me to sympathize yes. with him, and so I I find the comedic elements in this film to be kind of like the break I need from the principal character, which is probably a flaw of the movie, right? The fact that I'm so happy to not be around our hero. And I would rather hang out with these two drunk old landladies for whatever, like whatever the reason I, I do love these characters and I, and I find them to help this movie more than hurt it. Okay. I like them more now because of that. I think from what you just said, it kind of like uh, makes me see something. And I think you know, nailed this with one word when you said charming. Dr. Glendon is not charming. I mean, even Henry no. Frankenstein has a certain amount of, like, appeal. Like, he enters a room and you're like, he's kind of dashing. Like, what's up with this guy? Even, like, yeah. Dr. Yogami has this charm to him where he's, like, super polite, but he's impatient and, you know, he's trying to get information out of someone, but he wants you to, like, tell it in a story about your life kind of thing is how I feel about, you know, like, I'm even inventing personality for that guy, <laughs> you know, that might not even be it. But yeah. with, like, Dr. Glendon, you're right. He's a prick. And it's very hard, like, from the get-go. He's not a nice dude to people. He's very reclusive. And, and not in, like, the way the Invisible Man is either, where the Invisible Man is, like, very vocal and, and aggressive and, like, sort of, like, likes the theatrics of everything. Like, this guy is not theatrical at all. He's kind of a dud. It's a little unfortunate. It makes it hard to connect when you really kind of want to see him you know, get hunted down and, and taken care of, right? Like, you're like, <laughs> I hope they do catch this guy. And like, I don't want to watch the movie that way. Right, for sure. So he gets a room from Mrs. Moncaster, who, you know, she sees him up to his room and there's this great moment. Like, I laughed out loud watching it last night where she's like telling this long story about her husband who's dead, you know, but she's like going on and on and on. They get up to the top of the stairs. Here's your room. And he just shuts the door right in her face. It was this sort of maybe unintended comedy, but I think it was because of Zephy Tilbury, who plays Mrs. Moncaster, like her reaction to the door she shutting in her face just sold the entire moment for me. But yeah, this, so this is where Glendon pleads with God, you know, to please don't let me transform again. Or if I have to transform again, keep me in this room. Don't let me out there and hurt somebody. Uh, of course, all of that is for naught. So this is the scene we see him transform in a live shot. This is where that technique of using red makeup and red filters on the lights came into play because the camera hangs on his face while he's sitting in the window and he starts to move and, and realize he's transforming. And then you see like the Red Widow's peak start to form on his head. And then the camera tilts down to his hands. And that's where the cut is, where his hands will transform and have, you know, they've become covered in hair and then the camera tilts back up and his face is fully changed and so i thought that's a, it's a great transformation that's done differently than the original so i love that they use the employee like different techniques they have uh, different tricks up their sleeve here yeah they're gonna do a couple different techniques for transformations throughout the whole movie they, they're not beholden to one they figured out a couple of different ways whatever works best maybe for the sequence to tell the story at the time i, on, I honestly like kind of feel that they're working with just a real quick thing about his decision here to go 
to this little hotel room and stuff. I would probably try and find like somewhere underground where I didn't have a window in full view of the full moon. And if I did, maybe I would try and like barricade the door a little bit better or something. You know, like I just feel like he's woefully unprepared to deal with, <laughs> with what he's become, which is kind of that's kind of interesting in and of itself, where he's like, all right, now I'm at the point where like, I don't know how to like handle myself, you know, like I wouldn't know how to kill me if I even had the chance. Yeah, I think they could have done a little more or he could have been more a little more proactive about keeping himself in that room. Maybe there was a, this this element of inevitability that he felt like no matter what, he's going to end up out on the street, which is maybe why he chooses to stay in a, in a more slummy part of town. Oh, I see. Okay. You know, like, I think the movie goes to great lengths to really showcase how this is not a nice part of town, right? These are all derelicts. He could have maybe been a little more proactive, but at the same time, I think he chose that area of town for that reason. So that if he did get out and, and... and and kill somebody it wouldn't be somebody anybody would miss which is a really messed up thing to say but you know that could be the reality of it yeah no i think you're right i think he might be that much of a dick right like he may be that entitled and be like that much of a bigot or something where it's like well at least i'm killing a poor person kind of mentality As he is out on the street, this is this the sequence at the zoo. I have to believe that this influenced American Werewolf in London to some degree. Absolutely, I agree with you. Totally. We've got this great little sequence, which always makes me laugh, between um, what we are going to say is probably a prostitute and the guard at the zoo. I mean, what, what we're saying that is because, let's just clarify, he's cheat- He's a married man with kids cheating on his wife with this woman, and, and she's like, you promised to leave your wife for me, and, and he clearly has no intention of doing any of that. Right. Yeah, yeah I love the, the comedy in this scene. This might be the best balance of horror and comedy in the whole movie I because I, I find that couple like having their little fling on the bench with Glendon like lurking in the background you've got a lot of stuff happening all at once in this scene yeah and you even got live wolves you got real wolves we're gonna see actual wolves yeah and so he he lets one of them loose to sort of distract the guard and uh as the young woman is left by herself he attacks has he only killed women at this point yes that seems crazy and calculated. Yeah, he's only attacked women too. Like he hasn't, mm-hmm. like he attacked Eddie, but didn't kill her. So I wonder if that was something that they were trying to get to thematically that the censors stopped them from exploring more is the idea of the sexual urging or whatever, you know, because like what they used to say lunacy came from the full moon effects of the way that the moon would change people's brain right, chemistry right. and shit right and they would they would go insane or whatever so maybe playing more with that concept was what they wanted to do you know the code was like nah more plant stuff like stick to the plant stuff <laughs> keep it scientific yeah no one wants sex in their movies <laughs> i mean i will say like that's one of the things i do like about this movie overall is is how much it leans on science but I would, I would like it to have a little more sort of like folklore going because a lot of the other ones don't. You know, if this was more of like a Red Riding Hood kind of thing, right, with like the big right. bad wolf going after, you know, the hot young women. We get folklore stuff later with the Wolfman as we get into more of like the Larry Talbot storyline. So because of that, I mean, this is this is all like in hindsight, right? I wish this one sort of really leaned into what made it different from the others. Like, like for example, the science part of it, of this story is what I like about it. Because no other werewolf movie that I can think of really approaches this type of story from a scientific perspective. And we talked about that a little bit with um, The Invisible Man and how a lot of invisible characters that we grew up with became invisible through some kind of uh, supernatural means, maybe a superpower. And what I liked about The Invisible Man was how much of it leaned on the science of becoming invisible. So while it might not totally fit with what we know of as werewolf mythology, I like that this movie is different in that way and that science is such an important part of it. That is a very big theme in the Universal Monster movies overall I, as well, I feel. Even in Dracula with Van Helsing, we're bringing in a lot of like scientific theory in the first place, but right. especially with like the mad scientist trope, right? That they've all but pretty much created or, or at least like sort of like solidified into its like iconic form. Yeah, so like it is kind of cool. I do agree with that. Like I do like that this werewolf, you know, for all intent and purpose is like science based, right? He's not mythical Mm -hmm. or supernatural. He's not to the degree that he is like in other stories. 
Yeah, it's really, like I said, it's really just a hindsight thing. There's no way they could have known what was coming. But as somebody watching this movie in 2021, I've seen a bunch of werewolf movies that all kind of build on the same ideas and themes. I like that this one makes a left turn, but it wasn't really a left turn at the time. Yeah, and and it's more obvious when you think about it he's even like the way he's created the moonlight beam and everything like that you know like he and the way he has his you know uh he's got his doorbell ring with the monitors and stuff and everything like he truly is into like all aspects of science and stuff he's very science fiction this guy yeah for sure and so now with the body count stacking up scotland yard is kind of at a loss for what to do the chief sir thomas forsyth is starting to threaten firing his employees if they can't figure out what's going on. And so now Yogami, Dr. Yogami, is out of the flower blooms, right? So now he's going to be next to transform that evening if he can't get his hands on another bloom of the, the Merephaza. So now, with all of those resources depleted, he goes to Scotland Yard himself to sort of give them fair warning that there is a werewolf, right? He finally, was this like an hour into the movie, he finally goes to the police to say, you know, there's a werewolf in your midst and we have to protect against it and we get that joke there too again where uh, the guy's like where have i met you before <laughs> and at that point it's just a, a running gag i think because these guys never met right so he he pleads with thomas forsyth to obtain this marifaza from glendon's laboratory it will stop the murders in their tracks but of course this is a lot to take in because the wolf quote unquote escaped from the zoo there's people who believe that it was just this wolf so we're going to catch the wolf there's no such thing as werewolves they got to get a warrant probably like all that kind of shit right right there's still a lot of sort of uncertainty among the police especially with this wolf loose from the zoo so now the marifaza has one final bloom on it there's going to be another full moon that evening which this is such a weird werewolf movie thing where there's full moons like three nights in a row but now they need to speed up the blooming process on this plant because otherwise somebody else is going to die but now of course we know there are two werewolves who both need access to this flower and it's like two wolves and only um, enough for one right one way or the other somebody isn't going to get this thing Correct. With the flower not yet bloomed and, and night quickly approaching, Glendon decides he's going to secure himself as much as he possibly can. And he goes to this old estate, which it's not explicitly stated who it belongs to. It could be his old family estate. I think it's, it belongs to Lisa's family. So it's, it's Glendale Manor. And the help was like, oh, Dr. Glendon, like we missed you coming around when you used to court Miss Lisa all the time, right? So I have a feeling that's like sort of maybe like where she grew up or her summer home or something like that. Uh, and it's just sort of falled into dismay, but it's being haunted by these creepy maid and this butler are still there hanging out. Well, presumably the family still lives there, but Lisa has moved out. Glendon knows that this estate has like an old not quite a crypt, but it's like this unused cellar. It's covered in cobwebs and has bars on the windows. And, and More appropriate, more like what I was thinking last time. You know, go here. Just go here last time. Right. And so, yeah, he's going to secure himself there. He's going to ride it out, so to speak. The room he decides to stay in, which I thought was pretty cool, is called the Monk's Rest. I don't know what that signifies. Well, you know, we were in Tibet in the beginning of the movie, and I was thinking Tibetan monks, so maybe they're trying to bring some of that back here at the end. So as Glendon is in the Monk's Rest... Just trying to, like, ride it out. He eventually transforms into a werewolf as Lisa and Paul arrive. Okay, I love this. I actually think this is really cool. Like, this, to me, feels like a big punchline. Like, all of that drama throughout the whole movie and, like, them being separated sort of from the whole movie, for them to both come here at the end. And it totally feels, like, coincidental, too. It doesn't feel forced to me at all because Paul is also very familiar with this place and he wanted to check it out before flying back to America. And if they hadn't shown up, I doubt that Dr. Glendon would have gone insane, like, the way, he, you know, like, it almost would have worked. It almost worked. It makes so much sense. I I love this part. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, it does feel organic in in that all these characters end up in the same place at the same time. It makes perfect sense that Paul would want to come see this place where he used to hang out as a kid before he flies back to the United States. But yeah, if they hadn't chosen to do that, Glennon probably wouldn't have 
lost it you know he wouldn't have seen her he wouldn't have torn through the bars and it plays back into the whole thing about like you know he warned her you know of course he didn't do it politely or anything but like it's like a weird i told you so moment <laughs> like in that sense too i mean they weren't expecting right. him what why would he be there like there's no reason for him for them to understand why he's really there but it makes sense to the audience and to him as a character why he would go there you know he, he's probably thinking about lisa wishing like he didn't screw things up so bad and then here she is and first thing he can think of is to kill her yeah and so in the in the fight that ensues he attacks lisa but paul intervenes and manages to beat glendon into submission which in other werewolf movies i couldn't imagine a dude just fighting off a werewolf as easily as that <laughs> no in any like modern werewolf movie paul's getting his head ripped off and like his heart eaten in like a minute <laughs> there's no way but because this is like a, a man-wolf hybrid that is mostly man, kind of, Paul manages to knock Glendon out and take Lisa to safety. Uh, he does bust them over the head with like an eye beam or like a two by four. Yeah, I think he finds like a big piece of wood, like a stick or a tree branch. Yeah, it looked pretty severe. I, I was going to give it to him because I was like, well, like I know werewolves are supposed to be supernaturally strong and stuff. But like, you know, if someone were to do that to a regular person or even a regular dog, like it would knock them out, right? So, like, if you just combine the two, why do they have to be stronger than one or the other? So I was buying it. Right. The important thing about this scene, though, is that Paul recognizes Glendon. In the very next scene, he goes right to the police and tells him, like, who it was, right? And I think this is where Henry Hull may have been onto something. I mean, this is the most important thing about this particular werewolf design. This is the moment Paul had to be able to recognize him as Glendon. Although technically, and I'm not going to say this is better or anything like that, but if we did see a Yogami wolf earlier and we weren't supposed to know like quite who was who, they could have done, you know, like a distinguishing stripe or like a scar or like something. I'm, I'm kind of glad that this idea paid off, though, the way it did. Like, it's pretty clever. Ultimately, I think he had a very valid point, Henry Hull, like when what he was talking about. Oh, totally. Uh, I think in that situation, Jack Pierce probably just hated being told what to do. Yeah. And so Paul takes that information to the police. And now this story that we heard from Yogami and from Aunt Eddie is starting to make a little more sense. Like now we can maybe start to believe something is definitely wrong. The police make their way back to Yogami's place and it appears Yogami killed somebody that evening as well. Without a bloom to stop him from transforming into a werewolf, he killed somebody in his home. We don't see who it was. Do you remember the scene? The police in his flat and there's a body under the, the blanket. They just find the dead body in his apartment under the sheet. Right. And then Paul finds the spent flower buds in the waste bin. And now everyone is pretty much convinced that they have to at least find Dr. Glendon and speak to him. Well, like what a revelation is like, we just confirmed that uh, Dr. Glendon is a werewolf. Now we know that this other guy's a werewolf too. It's like, geez, man, when it rains, it pours. Well, I don't know that they are, suspect Yogami yet, but they know that there is some kind of wolf man on the loose, probably Glendon. They might even equate this death to one for Glendon too. They'd be like, oh, which is good for Yogami, you know, like he could just have all of his kills be blamed on this other guy. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so now we move into pretty much our climax here. Glendon has returned to his lab where his assistant has been tending to, to the plant. And as he is preparing to treat himself, you know, give himself this antidote, he is momentarily distracted. And in that space of time, Yogami sneaks in, clips the plant, and then uses it on himself. I love that shot, man, where he just like swoops in at the very last second and steals it away from him. Yeah, like he has the moment to do it. Glendon has the scissors. He's about to snip the bud off and then decides he's going to wash his hands. And in that space of time, like just his whole plan goes to hell. Yogami uses the plant and leaves Glendon to transform. And this is maybe the biggest missed opportunity in this movie. By giving Yogami the opportunity to stop himself from transforming, we don't get a werewolf versus werewolf fight. 
Exactly, Dan. You know, like, it's all leading to this, like, another werewolf on screen, like a one-on-one battle. And, like, it's kind of funny because this would sort of become a formula, like, in the 90s or 2000s or something, where, like, the hero at the end of a movie would fight, like, a warped version of itself. Like, it would happen with, like, you know, I think Marvel movies are kind of famous for seeing this where, like, the Iron Man fought the Iron Monger, uh, Hulk fights the Abomination. It's just, like, sort of a mirror-mirror version of our hero. And it would have been great to kind of get a a sort of play on that with this just like uh, you got a sort of werewolf on werewolf battle I mean there's so much symbolism just in that imagery alone I'm so upset we don't have that it will it would take us until 2010 to get the werewolf versus werewolf fight that we really want they did end up using that in the uh the 2010 wolfman with Benicio del Toro so we do get it eventually but it took a long time him and Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, yeah. Directed by Joe Johnston. Very nice. Ori- originally, Mark Romanek, I think, was supposed to direct that. But I like that version a lot. And, you know, that that was on my mind while I was watching this one. Because I was like, holy shit, is that where they kind of lifted it from in the future? Is that there's going to be, well, there are two wolves in this movie. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I just, I, you know, it, the opportunity was there. It's a, it's a shame they missed it. But we do get a pretty cool fight scene, though. Like what what does exist is, is pretty violent as far as like fist fights go. The whole movie is very violent. Like I mentioned, it was kind of like a slasher flick. I don't think this movie's like necessarily scary. Like I find the other ones to actually have like pure moments of horror and dread and like weird shit that makes me have trouble sleep at night. There's less of that. I mean, frog eating plant. Okay, but. Like, like, <laughs> for the most part, this one just feels a little more sort of, like, brutal, like, in that way, right? Like, again, maybe more for, like, adults than kids. Like, I would put this one closer to something like The Mummy than something like The Invisible Man, because even his murder spree in that doesn't feel quite as brutal, I guess, as this guy. This guy just feels like he's tearing everything to pieces and leaving a wake of blood. Yeah, it's just a lot of thrashing, and um, it's very primal. That is purely by design, I'm sure. But yeah, I just, I love that the fight we do get between Glendon and Yogami is exciting to watch. You know, they cut it up because of it, apparently it was too violent, but what, what we do get is pretty good, I think. It's just not werewolf first versus werewolf. And then, of course, Paul Ames gets uh, attacked in this sequence once Yogami is killed. He strangles Yogami, right? Like, that's how he dies. And in the following scene, as Glendon is about to attack Lisa, he is shot with an ordinary bullet and killed. So, it appears this movie is not really all that interested in exploring the immortality of werewolves. We don't get silver bullets here. Yeah, no silver anything. What I know is the only way to stop a werewolf ever was the silver bullet in the heart. Otherwise, he's going to come back like, you know, in Monster Squad, he's going to reform every time or something. Right, right. Yeah, so we don't get any of the sort of traditional uh, werewolf extermination techniques here, right? It's just sort of they can be killed by normal means. It's unusual, but I'm not against that. Like, again, I don't feel like there needs to be like a way, like the same way every time. You know what I'm saying? Even with like Dracula or like vampires, like I don't feel like every vampire should need a stake to the heart. Or You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying as an example, like I think it's kind of cool that these werewolves can be killed other ways like it's just you know it's just the way these werewolves operate i guess you know i mean you still got to get close enough to strangle one of them or or shoot one of them or something like it's not that it's easy you know it doesn't make it any easier necessarily i guess you could strangle someone or shoot them in their human form which makes it a little easier but other than that like I, i i didn't really even think twice about it Again, it's all because of hindsight, right? We we understand where werewolf movies have come since this one. This is like the first attempt, you know? So I think I try to embrace what makes this one unique in those ways, as opposed to being like, well, it doesn't, you know, there's no silver bullet, you know, like this is bullshit. Yeah, I do like the way that this one differs from, you know, its brethren, so to speak. I just, I wish the characters were more interesting. You know, like, like that that's really where the fault is in this movie, as far as I'm concerned, is that just the leads, they're, they're not very compelling. And the, the story gets a little bit redundant towards the middle. You know, it's like every night he's, he's just trying to lock himself up and not kill somebody, he ends up killing somebody. So like, it gets a little bit, uh, they, they keep recycling that sort of portion of the movie. But no, overall, I think this one is, is a great first attempt at least 
least in terms of werewolf lore, in terms of the special effects needed for the transformation sequences. Jack Pierce's makeup is great. I think I like more than I dislike, but it's it's an interesting experiment. You know, it's interesting to see them try to figure out how to make a werewolf movie in this. Yeah, I see it as almost, um, you know, like a prototype, right? Like Dracula, not sure. so much. Drac- Dracula is like there. It's all there. Like, there's yep. no version 2.0 necessary. But here, there, we need a firmware update to the <laughs> werewolf story. Some of it's here. What's here is, I think, I think there's more good than bad for sure. But this movie is derailed. It, instead of going off the rails the way I would like, it gets derailed left and right by um, different things. Like, there's all the uh, horticulture stuff, like with the botany and everything. There's the the drama, the melodrama, and things like that. By the way, I think uh, Valerie Hobson might be my favorite actor actress slash actress in this movie the problem is she's not in it enough i think her presence is is really strong i would have i would have liked her to um been around a little bit longer possibly but you know ultimately i do like this a lot more than i thought i was gonna revisiting it it's got a lot of strengths it's got a lot of problems but the pros outweigh the cons you know and like we were talking about the effects are great the look is cool and uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here that people should definitely see and if you want to see what a frog eating plant looks like look no further you won't uh, sleep for a couple days I mean seriously like Audrey 2 needs to take a break because this thing is (laughs) haunting my dreams next to Cthulhu at night like it is crazy (laughs) the design they came up with for that plant anyway Definitely check this one out. I think, Dan, I think what it comes down to, we've been a little spoiled. Yep. They have been killing it. They've been coming right out of the gate. They just have not missed a beat, and that is not usual, right? Like, it is it is kind of unusual to watch those many good movies in a row. So, like, I, I take a little, you know, I take a bump here or there, and it's not even a bad one. No, and this is the first time where they really break from sort of the established formula that they had where they were working with, you know, like, I mean, they made three movies with James Whale already, right? And he wasn't going to be coming back. They didn't use Karloff here. They didn't use Lugosi. They didn't use Claude Rains. Like, they didn't go back to their established cast of, like, stars, right? And, like, this is almost entirely uncharted territory. There wasn't a single name involved in this production that I recognized, aside from John P. Fulton, who did the special effects for the first six, we kept seeing the same names over and over again. Like, how many times did we hear John L. Balderston's name when when it came to the script? This was like a completely different production altogether. You know, they didn't employ any of the usual suspects here. It makes me wonder why they would not employ some of those people when they already sort of had proven themselves as being able to crank out successful horror films. So a big part of it could have been what was going on with the Lamleys. You know, Junior Lamley wasn't as involved with this one. As far as Universal was concerned, it could just be that whoever made these decisions just didn't see what Junior Lamley saw, didn't see the movies as being anything more than cheap entertainment. And so didn't maybe care as much about the finished product. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of supposition, but this definitely feels like a a strange deviation almost entirely. Like from like the entire production seems like a weird thing when you look at what came before it. But you're right. This is not a bad movie by any means. They were trying to make something that didn't really exist and trying to figure out how to do it. And there are growing pains when you try to do something like that, right? So the the first one, again, to compare it to food is like the first pancake. And, uh, you know, so they learned how to make a werewolf movie after this. And fortunately for us, we get the Wolfman in six years. Well, a couple months in our time (laughs) and we'll be watching that one. A couple months in our time. That's right. So, yeah, I, I think that anybody who loves old monster movies, loves Universal Monsters, who hasn't seen this one, owes it to themselves to check it out because uh, it's got a lot to offer, even if the characters are a little bit underdeveloped. Not all of them, but the most important ones, I think, are a little bit flat. And I think the hallmark, again, to these are the creatures themselves, right? The monsters. That's what we're here for. That's what made us. And, you know, to see this werewolf on screen is still a thrill. So as an audience member, I'm I'm sure like it went over better than we can imagine. You know, I'm sorry. I'm sure that werewolf was way scarier back then than it is today, you know? Uh, But like, yeah, it's just interesting to see them sort of finding their way again. And you can see that in the movie. And that I think makes for an interesting watch in and of itself. Yeah. Definitely. Agreed. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. I guess it's time for us to get back to our greenhouse. 
But don't worry, we'll return on Friday, May 28th to discuss 1936's Dracula's Daughter, starring Gloria Holden and the returning Edward Van Sloan as Professor Van Helsing. All right. Nice. In the meantime, you can follow us on Twitter at MonsterMadePod, on Instagram and Facebook at The Monsters That Made Us, and you can email us at TheMonstersThatMadeUs at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Dan Cologne. Mike, where can listeners find you? You can also find me at Twitter at the underscore Mikester. You could find me and all the other shows I'm on at CageClub.me, Facebook.com slash CageClub, or at CageClubPod on Twitter and Instagram. And I just wanted to say quickly, Dan, since you are on my latest episode of a show I do called Third Times a Tr- charm uh where we are talking goldfinger i just wanted to give a quick shout out about that show which is the third of every month third time's a charm this month we are talking goldfinger the two of us with uh, our friend brian rodriguez so check that out that's right in addition to being a huge monster fan i also love james bond movies and that was a really fun conversation mike so i want to thank you again for having me on for that absolutely And if you enjoyed this episode and you want to support the show, please give us a five-star rating on iTunes. If you'd like to become a Patreon supporter as well, you can do so at patreon.com slash the monsters that made us. And let us not forget about our t-shirts on TeePublic. You can find the link for that in our aforementioned Twitter and Instagram bios. For all other things Cage Club related, just head on over to cageclub.me. That's cageclub.me. Stay spooky, everybody. Ow!